and welcome to the third annual Harkness Lecture. Let's see if I can see my notes. My name is Bernie Schlager, and I serve as Executive Director of the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies in Religion and Ministry here at Pacific School of Religion. And I would like to officially, cordially, welcome you to the third annual Georgia Harkness Lecture with Professor Susanna Cornwall of the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Professor Cornwall. We are honored by your presence this evening. Before I hand over the microphone to Jay Johnson, who will formally introduce tonight's speaker, let me say a few words about this lectureship and then invite you to support financially the work of the center. The CLGS Fall Lecture Series is named in honor of Georgia Harkness, who lived from 1891 to 1974, a pioneering theologian in the Methodist tradition, a leading force in the ecumenical movement, and the first woman hired to teach theology at a Christian seminary. The author of more than 30 books and many articles, Harkness focused her teaching and writing on the practical application of theology to the pressing social issues of her day, ranging from women's rights to racism, war and peace, international relations, and later in her life, full civil rights for lesbian and gay people. Georgia Harkness retired from teaching after serving on the faculty here at Pacific School of Religion from 1949 to 1960. The passion that Harkness brought to her work of making vital theological connections among wider cultural and political issues, her keen interest in employing poetry and the arts in her theology, and her firm commitment to civil rights and social justice, all of this resonates deeply with the work of PSR Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies in Religion and Ministry. CLGS was pleased to inaugurate our Georgia Harkness <coughs> Lecture Series in the fall of 2010 with a wonderful lecture delivered by Dr. Rebecca Parker, President and Professor of Theology at Star King School for the Ministry here at the GTU, entitled The Astonishing Fire at the Heart of Things, Spiritual Stamina for Troubled Times. And then last year, our second lecture was with Professor Laurel Schneider, Professor of Theology, Ethics, and Culture at Chicago Theological Seminary and she spoke on the gravity of love, theopoetics in a queer world. At CLGS, we strive to serve LGBTQ people of faith and our allies, communities of faith, and the worlds of learning through a variety of programs designed in the words of our mission statement to advance the well-being of LGBTQ people and to transform faith communities and the wider society by taking a leading role in shaping a new public discourse on religion and sexuality through education, research, community building, and advocacy. In order to continue our work and expand it as we enter our second decade, we need your help. And so this won't be a long pitch, but what I'm going to do in good church fashion is pass around a basket. At the end of each pew, you'll find handy little envelopes, and any contribution is deeply appreciated. So thank you, welcome, enjoy the basket passing, and Jay Johnson. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jay Johnson. I'm uh, on staff. I'm the Director of Academic Research and Resources at PSR Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies in Religion and Ministry. And it is a pleasure to add my word of welcome this evening to this third annual Georgia Harkness Lecture. I'm also pleased to note that the Women's Studies in Religion program here at the Graduate Theological Union is a co-sponsor of this evening's lecture. And I would encourage any GTU students who are here this evening to add the certificate in women's studies and religion to your program, which is relatively easy to do. In addition to the certificate of sexuality and religion that PSR offers. So actually, why don't you just do a whole series of certificates and forget about your degree program. Um, I'm particularly pleased to welcome Dr. Susanna Cornwall to Berkeley for this occasion. I was first introduced to Dr. Cornwall's work when a collection of essays called Transformations was sent to me. Um, and Dr. Cornwall's essay in that 2009 collection called Apophasis and Ambiguity, The Unknowingness of Transgender. You gotta love it just for the title. Um, and that essay is, in my view, one of the very best in that anthology, and it made me hope that she would continue writing, and thankfully she has. 
Uh, Susanna Cornwall is postdoctoral research associate with the Lincoln Theological Institute, Department of Religions and Theology at the University of Manchester in England. Her current research focuses on intersex, uh, I'm sorry, focuses on interactions between intersex and faith identity via empirical research with intersex Christians in Britain and the implications for theological policy, pastoral care, and healthcare chaplaincy. Dr. Cornwall received her PhD in theology from the University of Exeter in 2007 and is the co-author of Sex and Uncertainty in the Body of Christ, Intersex Conditions and Christian Theology, it was published in 2010, and Controversies in Queer Theology, published in 2011, just last year. And I'm using that book for my course in Transforming Christian Theology this semester, and I can tell you, Dr. Cornwall, that the students in that class are also very happy that you kept on writing. And some of them are here this evening. And I just have to say one last thing here. When we were thinking at CLGS about whom we might um, invite to be this year's Harkness lecturer, Dr. Cornwall came immediately to mind. And lo and behold, just two days later, seriously, out of the blue, I get a Facebook message from Susanna Cornwall, who, said, who we had never met. And she said, hi, we've never met. Um, but I'm going to be in the US this coming fall. Might I be able to stop by um, and visit you all at PSR? And I said, uh, yes. <laughs> in fact, we'd like to extend an invitation to you to be the Harkness lecturer in the fall. Providence is a lovely thing. Dr. Cornwall will speak tonight on the topic, asking about what is better, intersex disability and inaugurated eschatology. Will you please join me in welcoming Susanna Cornwall as our third Harkness lecturer. Thank you very much for that nice welcome. Um, I'm staying in a hotel which is just over the other side of the UC Berkeley campus and I went up the Campanile Tower today uh, and the lady operating the elevator said, oh, where are you from? And I said, At Manchester in England and she said, oh, my mother lives in Nottingham, which isn't very far away. And she said, why are you here? So I told her and she said, oh, holy hill, it's wonderful, it's so beautiful. Um, it was exciting, I didn't know people called it that up here, but it's nice to be here on holy hill. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, and thank you to everybody that's, that's made it possible for me to be here, and especially to Jay for all he's done to, to help to organize this. So you've heard a little bit already um, about who I am and what I'm doing at the moment. And I just want to fill in a little bit more of, of the background to my current research project uh, before I, I get into the main, um, the main presentation this evening. So as you've heard, um, I did my PhD at the University of Exeter, also in the UK, um, completed in 2007. And that project was about the Christian theological and ethical implications of both the existence and the treatment of intersex conditions. But for those of you who, who don't know, um, if there are any of you here, intersex, when we talk about, about intersex, we're talking about conditions which cause a physical difference in someone's body, such that their body doesn't fit into our current definitions of maleness or femaleness. That could be a difference of genitals, People may have genital anatomy, which doesn't look typically male or female. That may be a difference of chromosomes or gonads, or it could be that there's an unusual combination of features. It's thought that about one in two and a half thousand people has an intersex condition of some sort. Um, actually, the numbers are difficult to, to track down, partly because these conditions often haven't been talked about very much in the past. But even if we're just talking about conditions where there's a visible difference in someone's genitalia, the kind of frequency we're talking about is akin to something like cystic fibrosis or celiac disease. So we're not talking about things that are very, very common, but also not so uncommon as to be unheard of. The reason why I ended up doing the PhD project I did was because in the reading that I'd done, I, I hadn't come across a, a kind of full-length project on intersex and theology. There were a few excellent short papers that already existed around the time that I started, um, such as those by Sally Gross, those of you that know her work. 
And from very early on in my PhD, I felt that it was very important that anything that I wrote about intersex people should be informed by intersex people. And I felt that particularly strongly because I don't have an intersex condition myself. And it's important to say from the outset, both in what I write and this evening, that the project that I'm engaged in isn't about me speaking on behalf of intersex people. Intersex people are well able to speak on their own behalfs. But one of the things that really interests me is the difference that intersex and uh, variant gender and, and variant embodiment and so on might make to all of our theologies and all of us in doing theology. I don't think these are niche questions or questions which should only be of interest to only some people or only people who are obviously affected. And so in my PhD, although I wanted very much to ensure that intersex voices and, and intersex people's experiences were represented, um, partly because of the limitations, I guess, of a British PhD, which tends to happen over three or four years, rather than the slightly longer ones that you do here, um, mostly that happened by my drawing on already published um, quotations, already published interviews from intersex people. For example, from scholars like Sharon Creaves, who done a very in-depth sociological study of intersex, um, and Alice domerat Draper working in history. Um, and although I did talk to intersex people about intersex and theology during that period, those conversations were off the record and I didn't conduct formal interviews. Nonetheless, I became increasingly convinced that formal interviews of some kind did need to happen. Reflection on religious faith is almost entirely absent from the sociological literature on intersex. And as I went on, I became more and more persuaded that intersex is not a minor or a side issue for Christian theology. But in fact, it's an issue which has implications for some fundamental Christian beliefs about the nature of God, about the nature of humanity. And it seems to me more and more strange that there wasn't already work done on intersex and faith identity. I'm working from within a Christian context, and I wasn't aware of, of any work in that area. The British Christian denominations uh, documents on personhood, sex, gender, sexuality, and so on, made little to no mention of intersex. And I wondered whether this would ever change if church policymakers actually weren't made aware that intersex even existed. And I felt that this was especially important because those few accounts by intersex Christians which I had heard or had read about tended to be disturbing ones. I was very saddened, for example, when I was in touch with a Southern Baptist pastor from the United States who lost his pastorate and many of his friends because fellow pastors had been so suspicious about his intersex identity and his ministry to other intersex people. I became in turn dismayed, furious and incredulous as I heard more about Sally Gross and her own experiences. Sally Gross was born in South Africa. She was uh, assigned male at birth, having had quite ambiguous um, genitals, became a Roman Catholic priest, but whose priestly vows were annulled and he was no longer allowed to receive communion when she transitioned from living as a man to living as a woman, despite having no surgery to alter her intersex anatomy. Gross has talked about the fact that she feels her faith was smothered because she's intersex. She was told by a superior in the Dominican order that her life was of little importance, and she was told by Christian acquaintances that not being fully male or fully female, she was also not fully human and that her baptism was only as valid as the baptism of a dog or a cat or a tin of tuna would have been. And so I really wanted to find out whether those very negative experiences were an unfortunate anomaly or whether in fact it was quite commonplace for intersex Christians to feel excluded or shut out in that way by communities of faith. Did intersex Christians, for example, tend to find it difficult to belong to churches which taught very strong and unwavering norms surrounding sex and gender? Were there Christians in Britain who had shared details of their intersex conditions with Christian friends or their church communities and had been rejected or ostracised as a result? Conversely, did intersex people in fact tend to find their religious communities places of support and places of welcome? In what ways did intersex people feel that their church congregations and the official teachings of their denominations might do more to celebrate and endorse the full personhood of intersex people? About a year ago, I began this project with the Lincoln Theological Institute in Manchester, um, and the project is entitled Intersex, Identity and Disability, Issues for Public Policy, Healthcare and the Church. 
And this has several strands. One strand is work to talk to policymakers um, and clergy, social responsibility, social responsibility officers, and so on, uh, within the Christian denominations in Britain. And partly that's because intersex isn't well understood and it's not something that's heard of very much. Um, and also that actually, certainly in a British context, any mention of intersex theologically has almost always happened as a kind of adjunct to work that's been done on transgender um, and homosexuality. Now there might be good and positive reasons for that, but actually it might also be problematic. Some intersex people have said quite strongly that they don't feel intersex is really anything to do with gender or sexual orientation, it's just a difference of physical sex, and that perhaps associations with LGBT groups are sometimes unhelpful, perhaps they might sometimes muddy the waters and gloss over the specific issues faced by intersex people. And so that's one of the reasons for thinking about disability in the context of this project as well, and I'll come back to that in a second. So another strand is to think about creating resources specifically for healthcare chaplains. Um, we've talked already about the fact that intersex conditions can manifest in different ways. Um, for many people, you wouldn't know by looking at their body that they had an intersex condition, but there are some intersex conditions which cause unusual looking genitals. And in that case, the condition is much more likely to be noticed soon after birth because everyone says, did you have a boy or a girl? And really we look in the nappy area, diaper area, to find out. Um, and there may be decisions, therefore, to be made very early on about whether a child should have genital surgery or not, um, and whether the child should be brought up as a boy or a girl, and this kind of question. And chaplains, healthcare chaplains, are at the forefront um, of pastoral care for families who have children born with intersex conditions. But certainly in Britain, they don't currently receive specific training or resourcing about intersex. And I'd be interested to know uh, from those of you here that have worked in chaplaincy whether, as far as you know, that's also the case here in the US. One particular concern of mine has been to think about creating resources to help and support chaplains as they navigate helping families whose personal faith might perhaps have been challenged by the birth of their intersex child, or perhaps whose faith conviction, convictions render them less likely to think about delayed or non-surgical intervention for their child. A third strand of the project is theological conversation with other academics working in the area of intersex. <coughs> Next spring I'll be hosting a conference back in Manchester, bringing together, I hope, eight or so of the scholars who've written in the area of intersex theology and the Bible. And I hope that the people who attend that conference won't just be people from within academia, because I think talking together about issues with chaplains and people from intersex support groups and so on will do more to improve Christian responses to intersex than me writing a book which gets put in a library and no one ever sees. Um, and during my time in the US, in Boston last week and here in Berkeley this week, I'm also thinking and talking um, especially to people who are involved in doing theology, <coughs> teaching theology, learning theology in seminary about the difference that intersex and acknowledgement of intersex might make to how theology is done in seminary. So one of my convictions as I began this project was that there might indeed be fruitful work to be done in the area of overlaps between intersex and disability in theological perspective. What I'd like to do this evening is to think about some similarities and some differences between intersex and disability and to begin to explore how these might be significant for Christian theologians, ministers and others as they consider how best to promote compassion and love for intersex people. It's important to say that that doesn't mean that it's never appropriate to think about intersex and theology, uh, sorry, intersex and sexuality in the same breath. I'll be thinking about that as well. Nor that intersex has no implications for broader theologies of sexuality, uh, because I think it does. Georgia Harkness, after whom this lecture series is named, had deep interests in providence and grace and reconciliation, and in particular eschatology and the difference that an eschatological perspective might make to theologies outworked in Christian lives. And so in particular this evening I'd like to spend some time thinking about what an inaugurated eschatology which takes account of intersex might begin to look like. I'll draw some parallels between social and theological responses to intersex bodies and bodies with physical impairments 
and to ask what the implications of theologies from disability might be for theologies which speak with intersex people. So, and the lists of cultural, social and theological accounts of disability often debate what exactly it is about physical disabilities, physical impairments, if anything, which create problems for people. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this literature. Uh, in the, what's often called the medical model of disability, a problem is understood as existing within a person's own body, stemming from their particular impairment. Able, well bodies are understood as normative and good, and there are sometimes moral um, narratives attached to that, as well as broader ones. And deviations from this norm are figured as fundamentally medical problems to which there may or may not be a medical solution. In this model, improvements for the quality of life of people with disabilities or impairments often focus on funding research into medical cures for particular conditions, or otherwise improving physical function for the impaired person. By contrast, the social model of disability emphasises not the impairment itself, but the treatment of the impaired person by other individuals and by society at large as the salient issue. Theorists who advocate this approach may argue that it's not individual impairments or impaired bodies that are the problem, but social responses to them. It's attitude toward or failures to accommodate people with impairments that are problematic, as much as or more than their actual physical differences. Nora Gross, in her study of Martha's Vineyard, famously suggests that the disadvantages of a physical difference, such as deafness, might be mitigated by social adjustments so that they're no longer disabling to the same extent. In her study, she argues that between the 18th and the 20th centuries, Martha's Vineyard had a particularly high instance of hereditary deafness amongst its population. But rather than expecting the deaf individuals to adapt to the hearing world or to form their own enclave, deaf and hearing residents alike used sign language. And this led to a strong integration of deaf people within the community and a lack of construction of deafness as necessarily or always disadvantageous. Now, critics have noted that the social model isn't perfect, it has its own problems. For example, perhaps it does too little to address the specific problems that, that some um, disabilities cause, such as pain, for example, physical pain. But nonetheless, it does encourage us to think about questions of ideology as they pertain to bodies. How do we know what's a good body, or a legitimate body, or a perfect body? What narratives are we working with? Intersex conditions, which, as we've said, are those where people have an unusual physical sex, such that they can't be categorised as clearly male or female, according to current definitions, might similarly be figured as a site of physical variation that could be understood as potentially non-pathological, akin to disability. This evening I'm suggesting that there are overlaps between theological conceptions of disability and those of intersex, and that this is particularly evident in relation to two areas that I'm going to focus on. First, the, the erosion of agency, and particularly um, sexual agency, and second, the issues raised by prenatal testing for certain conditions. I'll suggest that just theologies for intersex people and with intersex people must be grounded in an eschatology which figures their variant bodies non-pathologically, whilst acknowledging that these bodies, or certain things about them, may still be perceived as problematic by individual intersex people and often the parents of intersex children. Drawing on Jürgen Moltmann's eschatology in particular, I'll suggest there's a Christian theological imperative to live out the eschatological promise in this present world, not accepting that social norms are inevitable or unchanging, but always asking about what is better. So both impaired bodies and intersex bodies have been considered by at least some commentators to have been colonised, to have been othered, to have been stripped of agency in various ways. Many critics note the ways in which people with impairments have often had their authority as actors and decision makers usurped by others, and they have been judged not to be adequate self-representatives with decisions about care being made by medics, carers, and others without the input of the person in question. Theologians, including Amos Young, Deborah Cremer, and Hannah Lewis, have noted that people with impairments may also experience a kind of specifically spiritual infantilization or, or being caricatured as super pure or being moral exemplars um, in some way for other people. 
Intersex people too have often not been allowed to make their own decisions about their bodies or to access their own medical records. Many of the people who came forward in the mid-1990s to critique the early corrective surgery paradigm which, which prevailed at the time have described their experiences of being studied by doctors and medical students as invasive, as abusive and as dehumanising. They had experienced secretive and top-down models of patient care. In the last decade, there have been shifts to fuller disclosure and frank talk about intersex, but as recently as 1995, a medical student could win an ethics prize for an essay in which she argued that it was legitimate for doctors to withhold information from women with a particular intersex condition, androgen insensitivity syndrome, on the grounds that such doctors, uh, this is a quotation, are not actually lying, they are only deceiving. <laughs> this student justified these doctors' practice of failing to tell women with AIS that their testes had been or would be removed. Instead, the women concerned were told that they had ovaries and not testes at all. People with physical impairments too may encounter paternalistic medical discourse in which they're not deemed capable of understanding or making decisions about their treatment in a way that able people might be. This erosion of agency comes into particularly sharp focus in the area of sexuality. There's lots of literature in this area, <coughs> scholars noting that people with disabilities have often been portrayed or characterised as asexual. Um, this also happens with relation to intersex people. Sumi Colligan has argued that this comes about because the real agency of both groups is eroded by social constructions which say that only good bodies, only able bodies, are capable of having agency. The lived experiences of intersex and disabled people are therefore subsumed to broader social narratives about the significance of their so-called atypical bodies. Colligan says, these bodies have been stripped of their ability to pleasure and be pleasured through the mechanism of denial, the social erasure of sexuality. From this standpoint, both intersexed and disabled bodies are lurking in the social margins. Overall, medical and cultural assumptions about sex being reserved for heterosexed, symmetrical and genitally specific bodies tend to promote the expectation that sex and sexuality are privileges awarded to the normate only. Elizabeth Stewart in the area of theology has noted that people with impairments have often been somehow de-sexed with disabled made a kind of third category alongside male and female in things like public toilets, for example. Um, and she appeals to various processes of infantilization to which large numbers of disabled people are subjected. Processes which include an assumption of asexuality, the explicit denial of sexual needs in group homes and the dressing of adults in childlike clothes. In other words, disabled people may often be deemed not to be sexual at all, and this often happens to intersex people as well, because they don't find it, or others find it hard to fit them into a typical paradigm of what bodies and what sexualities mean. Colligan again acknowledges that for intersex people, there has been a shift away from older portrayals, which we might understand as a positive move away. Uh, we might think of historical portrayals of kind of freak show hermaphrodites being figured as especially or even excessively sexual. In other words, whose unusual physiology was made to carry inherently sexual messages. So we might understand a move away from that as a positive thing. But what Colligan says is that this traditional eroticized portrayal of so-called hermaphrodites has given way to a clinical medicalized model which understands intersex not as to do with sexuality, but to do with the medical management of a medical problem, but that this might be understood as also problematic. So to bring this into focus, we might, we might think about the recent shift of terminology. So I've used this word hermaphrodite, which was the term that tended to be used for the kinds of conditions which are now more commonly called intersex. But actually, even more recently, there's been a shift to another term, DSD, which is short for Disorder of Sex Development. About seven years ago, there was a shift, um, particularly within the medical establishment, but also more broadly, which had arisen from dissatisfaction with the term intersex because of its associations with things like transgender and homosexuality, such that, some critics argued, it wasn't clear that intersex concerned primarily physical difference rather than gender or sexual orientation. 
The medics and others who are in favour of the term DSD argue that it is more medical and less sexualising, and that parents who might be 